Hi there, everybody. Today we're going to talk about Dunbar's number. Oh hey, look who it is! Renowned British anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist Dr. Robin Dunbar himself. Hi Dr. Dunbar, how's it going? You can only have 150 meaningful connections with people! Ah, yeah, right, we, we were uh, just about to talk about that. Why don't you tell the audience how you figured out that number? How do you figure anything out? I looked at some monkey brains! Ah, right, yeah, uh, well, bye Mr. Dunbar. See you around, governor! So, as you may know, primates have unusually large brains relative to their body size, much bigger than any other animal group. But why did primates decide to become such colossal nerds? Well, there are some theories involving nutrition and digestion and stuff, but those are boring, so instead let's focus on the one that sounds like it's from a Marvel comic, the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis, which essentially posits that primates developed increasingly big brains because those gave them an evolutionary advantage in developing complex social strategies to achieve higher reproductive success. Basically, bigger brain, better at manipulating others, more reproduction, something something Darwin something. In 1992, everybody was bored because they hadn't invented making fun of Elon Musk yet, so Robin Dunbar decided to look at the ratio of neocortex size to total brain volume for different types of primates, and then compare that to the size of those primates' typical social groups. When he did, he found a pretty clear correlation. The bigger the neocortex to brain ratio, the larger the size of a social group. By extrapolating that relationship to a human brain, he found that humans should have an average social group of 148, but then he rounded it up to 150 because that sounds better in a Malcolm Gladwell book. Now, if you're just a regular, normie, not anthropologist, you're probably wondering, a social group? What does that mean? Well, in his book, Dunbar explains the 150 number in a very concise, very precise, very scientific way as, quote, the set of people who, if you saw them in a transit lounge during a 3 a.m. stopover at Hong Kong airport, you wouldn't feel embarrassed about going up to them and saying, hi, how are you? Haven't seen you in ages. In fact, they would probably be a bit miffed if you didn't. You wouldn't need to introduce yourself because they would know where you stood in their social world and you would know where they stood in yours. And, if push really came to shove, they would be more likely than not to agree to lend you a fiver if you asked. For short, you can call them And it turns out that if you look, you'll see the number 150 all over the place. Ford trucks, signs between 149th and 151st streets, and if you Google what's 2 times 75 but we also see it in naturally occurring human groups. There were basically three group sizes in pre-industrial human hunter-gatherer society. Temporary night camps, which had 30 to 50 people and were generally unstable with people constantly coming and going. Large tribes of about 500 to 2500, but those were mostly held together by language and cultural identity. In the middle though, we find clans. Groups with quote, ritual significance. In some cultures, it's the group that would, for example, be present at a coming-of-age ceremony. One interpretation of clans is that they were essentially someone's social group. For the 20th tribal societies with census data, when we look at clan sizes, we find a mean of 153 people, which as you might notice, is only about 4 more than 150. And that's just one of many examples. Neolithic villages in 6000 BCE had about 150 people, and William the Conqueror's Domesday Book from 1086 shows that 11th century English villages averaged around 150. In the modern day, although we've moved past the need for many old, naturally human things like hunting for food or dying of dysentery, we seem to have kept the 150-person grouping around. Religious commune societies like the Hutterites and Amish tend to sit at around 110 people and split once they pass 150. The smallest independent modern military unit, the company, is typically three 30-40 person fighting platoons plus command staff and support units, which adds up to about 150. Factories of the company Gore-Tex were famously kept to 150, as Mr. Gore found that once they got larger they required inefficient hierarchies. And one experiment even found that people sent Christmas cards to roughly 68 households, which consist of about 150 people because nothing says, you're a valued member of my social group, like a glossy 4x6 of your family looking uncomfortable in matching pajamas. Dunbar's number may be 150, but it turns out one other number he knew was 5, which Dunbar called the inner circle, the rough number of close contacts with whom people tend to talk at least every week, presumably before snap streaks became a thing. 
In fact, Dunbar identified a number of distinct social circles grouped in increasing factors of three. There are about 12 to 15 people in what social psychologists often call the sympathy group, which is defined as, quote, people whose death tomorrow would leave you distraught, which, uh, super chill definition, think social psychologists. We tend to talk to them at least once a month. Interestingly, 12 to 15 is also roughly the number of people on team sports, juries, and groups of apostles, although about 1 in 12 apostles tend to betray you, so watch out for that. If you go up another factor of 3, that's your affinity band. About 50 people who you would still consider real friends and talk to once or twice a year. Going past Dunbar's number, at 500, we reach your approximate number of acquaintances, and at 1500, you start to bump into the limit on the number of people you can actually recognize. Past 1500, we start to get into strangers. And you know what strangers love to do? Monitor your internet activity. Let me ask you a question. Did you know that a lot of ISPs monitor and keep logs of every website you visit, even when you're in incognito mode? Now let me ask you another question. Do you wish there was a way to make them not do that? And now here's a third question. Have you figured out yet that this is all a lead-up to telling you why you might want to use ExpressVPN, which encrypts your data and reroutes it through a secure server so that your browsing stays private? I've used ExpressVPN for years, both to keep my data secure and to do some of the other fun things a VPN lets you do, like accessing international Netflix libraries and streaming region-restricted sports and games. For example, you could watch this indie workplace comedy, which is still on Netflix UK. ExpressVPN makes it quick and easy for you to trick services like Netflix and Disney Plus into thinking you're streaming from a different country, giving you access to thousands of new shows and movies. If you, like me, enjoy the feeling of not being spied on, try out ExpressVPN and you can get three months for free by going to expressvpn.com slash H-A-I.